<laughs> All right. Hey, you guys. Thanks you for coming to BIM XP Network. My name is Zaina DeFilippi, coming to you from my home office in Virginia. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a BIM technologist at Smith Group, advisor for the Revit DC user group, and speaker at national BIM conferences. Five user groups along the East Coast have come together to bring you the BIM XT network. It's run by a board of advisors to help guide the meetings. Our hope is to provide a live forum for people to share and connect on processes and tools related to building modeling. As a side note, these meetings are recorded to provide online review for the future. Today's topic is very near and dear to my heart, as most of you know. It's on practical uses of Dynamo. First, we have up amazing award-winning presenter, Marcelo. He will present for about 20 minutes on a few practical uses, and then we'll switch over to a panel of experts. In our panel today, in addition to Marcelo, we have Tim and Hazel with Walter P. Moore, Michael Kilkelly, the founder of Arch Smarter, and Nick Sipes, application uh, specialist with CAD Microsystems. I must also mention that we here at the BIM XC Network heavily rely on Nick, who works as a seamless director behind the scenes. So thank everybody, should be thankful for Nick. Uh, during our presentation today, we will be having a panel discussion. However, we would like to hear from you, of course, about your experiences. We will wrap up about 2 p.m. today. If we run long, I will let you guys know. And, and of course, please feel free to jump off. We definitely try to make it by two. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to kick off today's meeting with a Dynamo Player script. As mentioned in the previous meeting, we are now focusing our winner for each event towards survey participants. And today's winner is Chrissy Iser. You win a $25 gift card, and someone from CAD Microsystems will be contacting you to make sure you get that today. Hopefully, you're on, online with us today, and, and thanks for joining. All right. So... Um, what makes these awesome is the conversation with you. So please utilize the chat tools. Um, we definitely want this to not only be a, a presentation from Marcelo and, and from our panel, but also, of course, have you guys interject and share your experiences and, of course, what you guys are doing with Dynamo. Um, as you all have may have noticed, you are all muted. We have Nick Sipes from Baltimore, as I mentioned, as a seamless director, but as he's a panelist today, we also have Jason Krunkel out of Richmond, Virginia, monitoring the chat. We'll be aggregating questions typically, but today we'll probably just go ahead and answer the questions with our panel. Um, so please feel free to, to ask questions. We definitely want to have those asked. We will be doing these once a month, as we have been. Uh, throughout the year. We hope to see you live in person eventually, maybe next year, we hope. Um, but you are the audience and the participant. Thank you for being part of the conversation about practical uses of Dynamo. Once again, we have Marcelo, Director of Advanced Technology with John A. Martin and Associates today. Hey, Marcelo. Hello. How have you been, have you been spending your time during the pandemic? Cool. I'm going to throw up that one at me. Can you hear me and see me? <laughs> I can. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, well <laughs> I've actually been pretty busy. I've been doing a lot of virtual conferences. And then um, also the, the kids are home, so I'm also uh, working with them on the distance learning. So there's a lot going on. That's awesome. And you're out in California, right? So That's right. Hopefully, hopefully staying safe out there. Enjoying the weather? We are enjoying the weather and staying safe, yes. Yes, it's a beautiful day today in sunny Southern California. And for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to have a presentation from Marcelo from his home office, you'll see that he has some lightsabers on the wall there. Maybe he'll interject and talk a little bit about those. But we love to hear about Dynamo, so without further ado, <laughs> I know you have a presentation for us. I'm up. You're up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Uh, yes, I am Marcelo. Thank you, Dana, very much. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. We'll get going. Okay, tell me when you can see my screen. You can see it. You can see it. Okay, awesome. From the beginning. Okay, hello, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Uh, yes, I am Marcelo. I am going to be doing this from my home office in Southern California. I understand most of you are probably from the East Coast. Uh, Dana, do you have a survey on where people are from? 
I sure do. Launched right to you. What state are you calling from? If you are outside of the states we've listed, please throw it in the chat. We'd love to see where you're calling from. We also love to hear the out of USA participants. We love those as well. So. Wow, that's cool. It's all, it's in real time. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yes. At least for us. I'm going to go ahead and share the poll with the audience. Oh, there you go. We see it as, as panelists, as hosts. But there you go. Other state and honestly, we have a lot. 29%. The majority of our users are outside of the East Coast. That's fantastic. Look at our reach. California, Arizona, Florida, Kansas, Michigan, all over the place. Please continue to add them in. New Jersey, that's fantastic. Welcome, everybody. That's great. This, this virtual uh, format allows that as well, huh? So that's awesome. Uh, all right. Thank you for joining us. Yes. I'm in my home office, Dana and everyone else. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, this is, if you're looking, if you get bored and you want to look past me, that is my lightsaber. Well, it is, yes, they're lightsabers. Uh, I mounted them with the Q, pull Q holder. Yes, it's a bit nerdy, but, you know, I'm okay with that. All right, so uh, let's talk about Practical Dynamo. Uh, all right, so thank you, Dana, for the introduction. And uh, let's get going. So let's see if we can get this going. All right, yeah, uh, um, I had a slide, but we, you already heard a little bit of, about me. Thank you, Dana. Uh, yes, I do present across the planet. I've been working as a director of advanced technology uh, at John Martin Associates. We're a structural firm in Southern California. Uh, this, de this December all would have been there 22 years. Uh, and I am a licensed structural engineer. These are some of the projects I've worked on in the past. Uh, you may recognize that's the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Uh, most re more recent one I did is that one bottom right. That's uh, Frank Geary's house uh, in uh, in Playa del Rey. Here's some of the families that I built inside of Revit. You may recognize that's the Revit elephant, cow, you know, so on. So the idea here is I, I like to push software to its limits and, and teach the world. Um, I still regularly talk uh, virtual now, but uh, um, around the planet. And um, anyway, check out check out some of my classes in the past. Also, I. I, uh, I run a, a virtual uh, website, like a media hub. It's called Simply Complex. It's got a blog post, a comic, uh, and uh, a Dynamo and Revit book that uh, – Dynamo, Revit, and Rhino inside Revit book that will be out very shortly. Uh, so head on over there and sign up for updates. Okay, so let's see here. We got oh, – I got about 15 minutes. About, yeah. questions, please feel free to throw them out there. Uh, this is Practical Dynamo, which could mean a lot, so I kind of took that as, as a loose thing to talk about kind of Dynamo in general. Uh, so here's my outline. I don't really like to do PowerPoint slides, but with that little time, I'm not going to be able to do any live demos, so uh, we'll just have to do it through pictures and, and some uh, <laughs> maybe some interpretive dance uh, here. Okay, so Dynamo for Revit. Here's our outline. This is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to go over some Dynamo for Revit. I'm going to go over some Dynamo for X. Because Dynamo is not just for Revit, and I want everyone to think well practically how else it could be used. Um, and then also, uh, what, makes, what makes something practical and applicable in your office? So let's talk about that too. Uh, okay, so uh, I have taught uh, a lot of classes over the years. Uh, a lot of them have been in Dynamo. I started using Dynamo in 2013. Back then, uh, I started uh, talking with a USC professor. Uh, when they were starting to look at it, and I thought, well, this is only for twisting towers. Well, what good would it be? And I thought, you know what? Uh, that's not the right attitude. I bet, I bet there's a practical use for this. So uh, back in 2013, I Googled practical Dynamo, and I got zero results in Google. And I was like, ah, that's something I definitely need to look into. Uh, so I realized that this is something that could become practical. Uh, so anyway, I taught a lot of classes on it. And what I've learned over the years, by the way, this is a, a – this is, a, this is a handout I put together of all the classes I've done. This is over 1,000 pages. Uh, I do teach a class at Autodesk University 2020 this year on um, – uh, it's a summary of all my classes. It's like a best of. I did one in 2019. Um, uh, that was Revit volume. DC. What's that? You presented at Revit DC, that class. Yes, that was actually the birth of that class, so thank you. I was invited to Revit DC, and that, and that started it. Uh, and then I, I did the class at Irish University last year in 2019, uh, and now I'm doing Volume 2 this year. So best of Volume 1 was last year, best of Volume 2 uh, this year. So check it out. Okay, anyway, uh, 
uh, this was the class I did, yeah. So it was a total of eight years of all the classes I did. But anyway, the point is, is that what I've learned from all the Dynamo classes that I ever taught uh, was that Dynamo is something, it's really simple. Now, if you Google Dynamo, you're going to get a lot of different explanations. So I'm going to tell you what my summary is of it. You also and, get a basketball team. I'm sorry? You also get a basketball team. Yeah, so you, you might get, want to be a little pointed with your Google. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a magician and, you know, so on. Uh, uh, so let, let me tell you what, what my definition is, uh, and this is going to be in the book. This is all it is. It's a visual programming language that creates its own parametric geometry and that reads and writes to external databases. So uh, the external database that we normally think of is Revit, but it doesn't have to be Revit. Another one we may think of is Excel, which is, you know, pretty common. Um, so Dynamo in and of itself is extremely powerful and quite simple in concept. Um, so if you, if you Google it, you may, get, you may get an explanation bigger than this, but that's, that's really at its core what it is. Now, let's talk really quick about Dynamo and why is it was so successful uh, and it's kind of grown like wildfire, right? So um, Dana, I know you have a poll here on uh, how many people, how, many, how much uses it is in everyone's office. Could you? Could you, sure would you mind throwing that one up? That'll kind of segue into this uh, next segment here. Three questions in there. The first one is how many of your team create Dynamos groups used by the entire office? The second one is just for yourself. The third one is how many of your team run scripts created by others? So just really how many people use Dynamo in the office is the last one, right? Cool. Give you a few seconds to answer that. We didn't put in a zero. <laughs> we, we started with a zero, but we decided to remove that. We're going to assume that the one to two percent is might be a zero. Um, but that's OK. Uh, throw it in the chat if you, <laughs> if you think you're a zero. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, there's like quite a few zeros. OK, and after this, actually. So it looks like we're definitely on the high end of one to two percent. But okay. after this, I'm going to ask another question on how you use Dynamo. For those of you who looks like some of your team members actually do use Dynamo. We had a few percentages in there. So this might give us a better idea of who actually doesn't use Dynamo at all versus how they use Dynamo, right? Okay. And it looks like we're getting some zeros in the chat. So uh, that's great. The, the, this is, this is going to be – the segment I'm talking about um, is a bit more un. Is, is, is about Dynamo, but not really in the way you think. The way I see Dynamo, especially right now, and probably the reason you're here, is that um, you also want to see maybe a bit more of it, how it could be used in your office, how you can convince others. So uh, I'm not going to show you necessarily uh, uh, how to use Dynamo, but really how to think about it so it could be successful in your office. So in order for something to be successful, this is kind of what I've learned over the last many years of doing this, is that uh, it's got to be inexpensive. Dynamo comes with with Revit, so that's kind of a that's kind of a you know non-issue. This is this is software that that um, over the years that I've been doing this, all the classes that I taught, all the tens of thousands of people that I've interacted with. This is kind of what I've I've come up with with making a successful software. And when I mean successful, I mean one that you can use in your office, and make money off of. One is that it's inexpensive. Dynamo comes with Revit, so. You know, you wouldn't say it's free, right? You pay for it in your subscription. But anyway, it's readily available. Next one is it's easy to learn, okay? We're going to talk about how Dynamo is so easy to learn, okay? And the next one is it practical, right? So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, that's the pillars that hold up something that's going to make something worthwhile using in your office. So we're going to think about it that way. It's not just practical, but is it easy to learn? Is it inexpensive, right? And you've got to think about it, too. It's not just you that you have to convince. It's others, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about, too. Okay, so enough slides. I want to show you some examples, but I want everyone to kind of think about it in that way, right? Like uh, there's a bigger picture here, not just, not just you, but who do you got to convince to, to keep it going in your office or to, you know, implement it a bit more? Um, so, um, you know, how are you promoting it? Are you overcomplicating it? Are you simplifying it? Or are you kind of in between? All right, so let's talk about that. Um, let's, let's look at this example. So if you Google Dynamo scripts, you see the, the image on the left? That's a Google image, okay? Now, if you're kind of looking at Dynamo for the first time or, or you're trying to wrap your head around it and you look at images to the left, you may not get a lot out of it, 
because a lot of it is just like spaghetti and fuzz and boxes and wires. And you're like, wait, what's going on? What? That may be a little too complicated for me. I'm not so sure. Right. So the way I think about it is if, if you're, if you're trying to think about how to use Revit, you're trying to wrap your head around it. You're trying to convince others. It's best to really simplify it first. Look at the image on the right. This basically is, um, do you know what this does? Five with five nodes. What this does is it takes a wall and it aligns it to an edge of an opening with a certain offset. Okay. Um, right now in Revit, it, it, we got some Revit users here. We have a poll on Revit. I'm going to assume we're all Revit users. Okay. Uh, think about Revit, right? With the align tool. If you wanted to align a wall here, uh, can you see my cursor? Hopefully. Sure can. Okay. When you, when you want to align a wall to an edge of an opening, maybe it's a, you know, an elevator shaft or whatever. Anyway, um, and you want it to be at a one foot offset. If you just use Revit and nothing else, you would actually have to line the wall up using the align tool up to the edge of the wall, up to the edge of the opening, and then you'd have to physically offset it back, right? Because there's no, there's no offset uh, value you can set in an align command. You can use Dynamo to do that for you. And look how easy it is. Five simple nodes. You lay them down, and then you can move a wall, basically, to an offset location, okay? By the way, I brought this up to, uh, to, to, uh, to Autodesk, and I said, you know, your align tool needs to have an offset value. And you know what they told me? They said it does have an offset value. It's zero. So anyway, uh, okay. So anyway, uh, the idea is that you can do this. So would you want to show someone on the left how to use Dynamo with the images on the left or images on the right? Just kind of think about it that way. Okay, so let's talk about some more practical uh, examples. How much time do I got? Maybe five minutes? We'll go with, we'll go with seven minutes. Okay. Looks like the majority of us also are architects, but split pretty good between the disciplines except plumbing. No plumbing in here. That's sad. They actually listen. Autodesk actually listens to users' comments. Oh, <laughs> maybe I'll stay focused here. You look at the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole whirlwind of a, of a conversation there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So um, I've got a little summary here. All right, so uh, practical dynamo. Okay, let's do it. So um, basically, uh, I'm going to show you some images that are basically in the book, and I'll show you my book later. Hopefully, uh, it's going through legal review right now, but these are some of the images. Whoa. Okay. Did I lose you there? No, I don't think so. Okay. I was getting a little glitch there on my side. Uh, basically, it's just one-page summaries on lay a bunch of nodes down, right, a bunch, just a few, and then you get this practical result in Revit. That's, the, that's kind of my format. It's called the Chi-Chi format. Anyway, I'm just going to run through a few of these so you can kind of see how practical Dynamo uh, could be. So we looked at that one where you just lay down five nodes, and then you can, you can align walls to um, an offset value edge of, edge of opening. Right, here's another one. You can take all your text notes and kick them all to uppercase. Right, right now in Revit, uh, if you want to take a text note and move it to uppercase, you can do that, but you got to physically select on each and every one. You can globally do that with just five nodes inside of uh, Dynamo. Uh, we looked at that one. Um, okay, so here's just some, some other examples. Uh, you have the ability to create uh, levels and grids um, you know, just on the fly. Uh, you can even link it to Excel files. I've seen people, uh, I've seen people control levels with Excel files from, from principles that don't even use Revit. They just, they just fill out levels and values uh, and then through that uh, they can drive the, the elevations through like a shared drive. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, And then uh, things like this, you can be able to uh, expand the functionality of Revit. Uh, typically like if you want to, in this particular case, uh, you want to be able to find the uh, surface area of a ramp. Well, if you look in Revit in the, in the instance parameters of a ramp, it doesn't give you the surface area. But with four simple nodes, you can actually get the total surface area of a ramp. Maybe you want it for painting calculations. Maybe you want it for formal calculations, things like that. Uh, you have the ability to lay down structure uh, easily. So I'm just, I'm just kind of going through here. I've got, I've got over 100 of these. But anyway, the idea is that with just a few nodes, you can get moving practical with, with Dynamo. And if you're, if you're thinking of trying to get into Dynamo or you're trying to convince someone in your office to get into it, this is probably a good way to do it. Don't show them the fuzz. Show them something simple so that way they can absorb it. And they can be on that side of the pillar, which is, ah, 
this is easy for me to learn. And if it's easy for them to learn, then that brings them in to try it. And a lot of times what happens when I, uh, as I've been teaching, you know, for I guess almost nine years now, uh, the, one of the only common complaints I've gotten is that, Marcelo, you basically are oversimplifying this stuff, right? And you know what my reaction is? You're overcomplicating it, right? And the idea is that if you can simplify something, then people think they can do it. And if they think they can do it, then they'll want to want to try it. If you show them a bunch of, um, you know, something that's overcomplicated that may like include every possible scenario, then they may be a little overwhelmed and they not want to try it. You want to bring people in to try it, get a good attitude going about it. Because, you know, quite honestly, you're always going to need to be convincing someone to use it, right? So anyway, this is how you can change a type using engineering logic. You can lay down floors. I saw a question about, I saw a question about DWGs, uh, CAD imports. You can take a CAD import uh, with grids and build them uh, in Revit with a CAD import. Uh, you can find imported DWGs versus linked and so on and so on. Okay, so there's a bunch of these. Uh, all right, so the idea is keep it simple as you get, as you get going. Now, let me show you uh, the word practical doesn't always mean super simple, but I'm saying simplify it, you can get people to use it. Let me show you um, some examples. I don't think I've ever showed this to anyone, Dana. These are some projects I've worked on where I've used kind of Dynamo to the extreme, but were still very practical uh, and helped me a lot. Um, Okay, so I thought you may. When did you say the book is coming out for, for those of us who are waiting in suspense? The book uh, is in legal review right now. I suspect maybe four to five weeks. Uh, if you go to simplycomplex.org, reference manual, uh, you can sign up for, for updates. Uh, okay. And all of those wonderful examples will be in that book, correct? Right. That's right. There'll be, there, are, there are hundreds of examples uh, in there. Um, and go check it out. Single one-page summaries. Uh, okay, let me just show you really quick some, some examples I've used uh, Dynamo for. Uh, this was a sculpture that we did, uh, uh, the, uh, I believe it was in the Guggenheim. Uh, anyway, we used a bunch of, okay, hold on, hold on. Let me move, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move ahead. Do use Dynamo for that, but let me move ahead. This is something I don't think I've ever showed anyone either. Where are you? Ah, here we go, check this out. Okay, so this is the Queen Mary in, in uh, Long Beach, California. We were doing some structural retrofits on the inside, but there was never a structural model that was actually built, a 3D model of the Queen Mary. So uh, we actually went to the Queen Mary before COVID and we got the original drawings. The things were like 16 feet long, super cool. So anyway, took that and did some, um, some calculations and then uh, built, the, built the hull and then um, basically was able to rationalize it using uh, some of the adaptive component tools inside of Revit and then we needed to take this and we needed to rationalize it further so we can get it into our structural analysis software so we can do uh, stresses on the whole hull, that sort of thing. Uh, and so we were actually able to use Dynamo to, to discretize it and rationalize it uh, once it was already you know, a model. This was just kind of like a way to basically rationalize it so, because this has you know, hundreds of thousands of, of points and, and, um, and, and meshes basically. Okay? Very practical, saved us a lot of time and was a lot of fun. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, we got into our structural analysis software, reports on it, uh, and then, uh, and then the, uh, the organization was so happy that they actually, uh, with the structural model that we built, this one, they actually put it up on their, on their Facebook page. So you can still find this model up on the Facebook page that was built from the original um, drawings, uh, as well as Dynamo, uh, to help us out in a practical way, right? Okay, cool. I think that's really it, right? I mean, you find a problem, you have a, you have a project, you have a problem, and you're like, hmm, there has to be a better way than me sitting in front of this computer for weeks and trying to rationalize it myself as a human, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so uh, th there's another thing I want to talk about really quick, if I have another minute or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, is that uh, Dynamo, is, we think about Dynamo as Dynamo for Revit, but it's not just Dynamo for Revit. Uh, if, if your program has an open API, you can actually attach Dynamo to it. So um, in, in other practical ways uh, in our structural office, we're able to link Dynamo with our structural analysis software. So one is like a structural um, a RAM structure, which is a structural analysis software. Uh, anyway, I won't, I won't get too much into it, but, uh, but with just some, some lines of code, you're able to actually take, uh, you're actually able to take Dynamo and link it with structural analysis software, not just Revit. 
Uh, and so you're able to, to reap the benefits from that as well as pull information, things like you would do with the Revit model, you can do with structural analysis models. So, so this is extremely beneficial uh, to do this in a very, very practical way. I have, I, have, I have hundreds of examples I could share, but I think I'm just, I'm just saying that's kind of the, the overall um, idea. And uh, are there any questions? Anything we should? I think we're doing pretty good so far. Okay. okay. Uh, if I could, before we close, I will show you uh, uh, one more thing that we're working on here uh, is, um, uh, is the book that's coming out, uh, I should mention it, uh, is not just Dynamo, but it actually includes a new technology called uh, Rhino Inside Revit or Grasshopper for Revit. And so um, these pages that you saw originally with, with, the, uh, with the Dynamo and the one-page summaries will have equivalent grasshopper ones as well uh, that you can take a look at when, when the book comes out. This so, is fantastic, this especially is for someone for, like me who actually is very opposite, I feel like, of most people who go from Dynamo to grasshopper. Mm -hmm. But most people, I feel like, go from grasshopper to Dynamo, right? So it gives you those equivalents, which makes it so much easier than trying to break it down or Google it or what have you. I will say though, and I posted in the chat, check out the Dynamo Forum. You can definitely post questions up there. The Dynamo Forum is fantastic. I know Marcelo contributes to the Dynamo Forum. A lot of us contribute up there and ask questions ourselves. So definitely check out there. Um, but yeah, Google is an amazing resource. You know, if you just Google how to find a point in Dynamo, <laughs> right? you'll find some amazing resources. But I'm very, very excited for this book. Okay, here we go. Yeah, and this was one I showed, right, with making levels in, in Revit. You could do the equivalent with Grasshopper. Anyway, just more resources out there to make your computational design, uh, um, you know, professional careers better. Okay, remember, keep it simple. When you show people, convince them, be energetic, do the practical stuff. doesn't always mean simple. Go out there and be successful. How's that sound? So it sounds fantastic, and it looks like everybody is super excited about this book, not just me. We have a lot, of, a lot of chatter going on about that. Um, so we're looking about five weeks-ish, right? And do you know the price of the book yet? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, I'm still throwing that around, uh, but it's, it's, it's Check out the website. We posted that in the chat. I'm sure you'll, you'll find that in there, simplycomplex.org. Nick Sipes posted it in there, so you Look, have that resource. Right here, okay? That this is awesome. It is a color print. It's almost 300 pages. So um, price hasn't quite been set yet, but check for updates. It will be out very soon. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that synopsis, Marcelo. Marcelo, for those of you who don't know, of course, Marcelo is a you know, very well-known person within the BIM community. He's a structural engineer as a background, but of course works in all kinds of different things, doing fun stuff, creating cows and faces and all kinds of unique stuff. We additionally on our panel today have Tim and Hazel. Tim and his associate with, uh, as well as a senior technical designer with Walter P. Moore. Hey, Tim and. What's up, Dana? How's it going? Thanks, Marcel. Good. good presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Tim and leads Autodesk. I'm sorry. Uh, it's <laughs> Your Desk University. They have a new semester out. So make sure you check out yourdeskuniversity.com for that information. We love that, those presentations. Thank you so much for those, Tim. And what, what do you have to add in terms of what you see as well as being a structural engineer in terms of some of the ways that you uh, have some practical uses within Dynamo utilized within your office? I know Walter P. Moore does push out scripts um, globally right within the firm and manages those. Yeah. No, I think, um, I think what Marcelo mentioned about keeping it simple, especially when people are learning it, is really important and addressing like small bite-sized pieces. And when I know people are trying to learn um, something like Dynamo, I often try to explain it like you want to start by thinking about um, how you would do it if you were teaching a new Revit user how to do something. So what would you click? Would you go and think about the properties and then change those? Or what, what is the big thing you're trying to do? And write it out in English. Um, because if you can write it out in English, sometimes you're trying to think about a bigger workflow, but then the smaller pieces, then it, each of those smaller pieces is often five things, right, Marcelo? Like yes. you're trying to like, how do I change a parameter? Well, you can find an easy answer to that. You might not find an answer to 
how do I change the material properties of lumber using sustainability <laughs> metrics from some online resource? But yeah, if do I were it piece to, like, by piece, right? If I work, piece it out. Work it so, out, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that would be one thing. I mean, I don't know that it's really adding. It's just kind of like reiterating what Marcelo already said. Um, but we found that not all of our computational energy is going into Dynamo. Um, there is a space and um, for that, and people are, are, are working on that. Um, and, you know, it kind of like varies. The, the space that we found people are using it most is when it's um, either like, I don't know, I want to say data manipulation, but that's so generic of a term. So if I try to like boil that down to smaller pieces, it's, um, it's kind of like applying properties to groups of the building at one time. Um, and so there's been a lot of that happening. Um, but then also just with regards to interoperability, we have um, like over the last few years, we've developed you know, hundreds of scripts, but really probably like 25 or 30 that communicate between Revit and Excel or between Excel and different analysis programs. Um, and those get used a lot. Uh, we have started transitioning those from Dynamo into other platforms. Um, some of the ones that like create Tecla models, those are happening in, in Grasshopper or Rhino inside. So for me, this conversation of Dynamo is, um, is, is definitely evolving into the conversation around computation and how a company um, proceeds forward in like automating things. Um, Cause you know, we didn't go to college to update foundation lengths you know, repeatedly, yeah. especially if we can get a civil survey of, you know, of the topography, and then you can just project all the footings to those points. Um, so I don't know, those would be some thoughts um, that I was thinking about as, as he was talking about. Um, Do you take notes, Timon? Oh, you bet. <laughs> Got to keep those thoughts always. in order, right? It's, it's, it's you know, I, I have to say, you know, it's always fun to see the cycle, but my first two classes were with Marcelo and with Havard Vashaug, um, in, I don't, 2015, 14, whenever um, we were in Chicago at the Built Conference. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun to now, um, yeah, I'm just honored to be a part of these conversations and to be hosting your desk with all the, you know, speakers, including Marcelo and Dana. I, sh I should mention that actually, Timon, that's an amazing story. So Timon learned Dynamo at a conference, went home, learned it, almost mastered it, right? Basically mastered it and went back the next year and taught it at the conference himself. So amazing success story and something that we should all look forward to. I myself, a complete dark moment, learned it from Marcelo's videos on Autodesk University and other, other ways. Uh, very, very big mentor of mine in Dy Dynamo, Marcelo, he knows that. Um, yeah, so can I add one more thing also? Absolutely, please. Just thinking about this practical, I think a lot of you guys looking at the survey, many were saying like, oh, we're not even using Dynamo. And the question is always like, oh, that applies to other people. And I think Marcelo repeatedly said like, there's all these practical applications. Um, but that's what happened. So I went to this conference, I saw these cool things happening. And then I just sat there and I was like, oh, I need, I need a problem to solve. Like I, I need to learn this. And I always, always, I've always learned things while on the job. And so you have to like look for opportunities and then you find them and then you jump on it. And I remember the two opportunities. One was we had numbers for our slab depths and it was actually for PT. Sorry for those who are not structural engineers and nerding out about this, but it was all about the, the tendons and the, and the, where they're located. And someone had done them based on the top instead of the bottom. But in the field, you put a tape measure and you want it to base to the bottom of the form so you know where that tendon is. And they were like, oh no, there's like 5,000 of these in there. Can we, can we do something to convert them to reach from the bottom? And I was like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Like oversimplified. I just have to take eight inches and subtract the number and put it in the new number. And the whole thing is done. That was a little bit more complicated because you have beam depths and stuff. Not all of us are structural engineers. I know, sorry. And then the second <laughs> no, I, think, I think that's an amazing thing, right? I mean, you came up with a problem that would have taken you so long to do manually. And you're like, there has to be a better way. This is such a logical problem that I have, right? Literally yeah. just yesterday, a user came to me and said, I, I'm doing a project in Europe. They call it ground floor and then level one above that. I need to rename all my views. And I said, oh my gosh, I already have a Dynamo player script for that. It's called views rename. <laughs> yeah. So 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Now, you can see I posted up in there that it looks like, unfortunately, 42 of us, 42% of us um, do not work at a company that manages Dynamo content, which completely is understandable. It's hard to manage being the person who manages it myself at Smith Group. I'll tell you, it's not always the funnest task, especially now working in a remote atmosphere. Um, one, one question that it looks like we get pretty often was emailed to us before the presentation was, is there a way that you can reorder inputs in Dynamo Player? Dyna uh, Timon, do you, do you have a good solution for that? Because I don't. I think I, I, I'm, I'm going to probably get corrected. And I know Michael's speaking next. And he's been doing some things with, with Dynamo Player. But I, I'm pretty sure the order in which you put the inputs onto the screen Creation. is the order yeah. that they'll show up in Dynamo Player. Exactly. And so if you want to reorder them, I think you have to delete them all and put because, them on one at a time. So, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll just copy the node and re -imp, you know, rewire it and then go on to the next one that I want to be next, you know, and just kind of systematically go through my inputs one by one in terms of order that I want. It's order of operations really is. Mm -hmm. I was hoping there was a better answer that maybe I didn't know. <laughs> I was going to say, as, as far as I'm aware, it's the same way um, that, yeah, a lot of times you end up remaking them at the end just to do it. Um, in the, not, in the older it, version... You should be able to create a Dynamo script to fix that. <laughs> in, in, the, in the older version of Dynamo, in the 1.x, when it was XML-based, it was actually pretty easy to go in and edit the XML to move them around. Mm -hmm. But when they went in and changed it to JSON, it if you open that up, there's like three or four different references, and I tried doing that again, and it just it just broke horribly. <laughs> so I do not recommend doing that. But yeah, I think so, you just have to remake them at the end. Nick Sipes here is an application specialist with CAD Microsystems. Thank you for that, Nick. And what what did you say? What would you say that you're seeing as an application specialist in terms of some practical uses of Dynamo? Um, it's it's a lot of uh, data manipulation is the easiest way for me to phrase it, um, where the data is in one way and I need to get it somewhere else, whether it's I need to get it to Excel, I need to get it from a model that is a linked and I need to get some parameter values from that. Uh, a lot of it is there's an annoying slow task that I don't like doing and um, normally we hire said intern for <laughs> and uh yeah i mean as far as I, I have to reiterate everything that they've been saying which is you know start with anything that you can write out a set of instructions for uh you know if you can sit here and write out a set of instructions on how to do the task then it's time to start you know thinking whereas if it, you know at some points it's the task gets too complicated but you know simplify it down think about the steps that you need to take um don't address the big, big problem. Address the little problems that make up the big problem. Uh, but yeah, most of the stuff that we're seeing that on, on our end are the, you know, I need this to create construction documents or I need this to get to the contractor or, you know, this piece of data is in model A and I need that same data in my model and I don't feel like manually copying it and having human error. So... The human error part is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, I want to ask Michael Kilkelly, who's the founder of Arch Smarter. We're very lucky to have him today. Hey, Michael, can you hear us? I can, Dana. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. So Tim did mention that you are doing some fun things in Dynamo Player. Anything you can add or join? So, uh, yeah, sort of. Actually, I'm, I think the point that you mentioned with Dynamo Player is 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 a real one it's like there are limitations to it and so um i've been looking at ways to get around dynamo player <laughs> but using it for what it's good for which is for organizing scripts um, so you can create your library have it there make it accessible for people but then to kind of take it the next step and then starting to get into um, the data shapes package if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. actually building interfaces inside of dynamo and I think that's really, if you think about like your maturity as far as automation goes, um, when you start developing scripts for yourself, like, oh, this is great. Then you want to share them with somebody else and like, hey, this is cool. Can you do this? Can you do that? And then you start getting into the customer support issues. Like, 
this doesn't work. It's not, you know, it's broken. Um, and with that, it comes making it a lot more user-friendly. And so um, that's one area where Dynamo is not great out of the box because I, I think of it really as like a DIY kit and that you're starting, you know, my, my analogy is like you're using Revit and it's like a sundial. And then you get Dynamo and you can start to automate it. And it's kind of like one of those alarm clock kits. So you can like plug the wires in and like make your own alarm clock. Um, and then you get into add-ins, which are really more like buying an alarm clock at the store that's nicely packaged. Um, so using something like Data Shapes lets you bring a lot more like usability into it. So you can create a, a user interface that users who aren't that comfortable with Dynamo can still use the automations and not be scared of it. Um, and that's, I think that's an important part because you're not going to have, um, particularly in a, in a large firm setting, you're not going to have users who really want to get in there and know how it works. They just want to get their job done. And so, um, you know, that's, you, it has to cater to both, both, you know, like the, the geek audience who wants to know how it works and then the people who really want to just move on, you know, automate this and then move on. So the good thing is though that Dynamo provides a toolkit to be able to cater to that. So if you do want to polish it, you certainly can, you know, create something that looks good and works good. Like Absolutely. your way of thinking about it as a DIY toolkit because it shows like how powerful and yet how personalized it becomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to get in there, you know, you can do that. If you don't, there's other options, you know, that as a tool creator, you have to accommodate, but um, it's, you get that spectrum for sure. Absolutely. And I would say that the packages for Dynamo are really wonderful because they, unlike add-ins, are free, right? You can get them um, downloaded pretty easily in most cases and available to at least you. So if you do find that you need a custom package, luckily those are pretty easy to get. So, you know, the, as Marcelo mentioned at the beginning, you know, the, the cost of entry is, is mm -hmm. nothing, right? Which makes it very, very nice. Whereas if you were to go and purchase an add-in, you know, those might get kind of costly. But yeah. of course, I know Timon, he creates his own add-ins as well, you know, has buttons up in the tabs and Revit and, and what have you, and definitely mastering that side of, of coding is, you know, fundamental to be able to be able to give your, your users those types of tools, right? Timon, do you have anything to add to, to that? Oh, I'm sorry. I was like, was that a question or a statement? <laughs> I, I was like agreeing with it. I think it's both. Um, <laughs> yeah, mastering coding. I think if I was if I was um, someone who's who's looking at where to grow, um, there's or or thinking about where our industry is going, I do think designers um, can really benefit from kind of two areas, and they're connected to Dynamo very much. And one is um, databases, just understanding basically how databases work. Marcella, you mentioned that Revit is a database, but there's other databases also. Um, I think databases is, is a really, really helpful, just basic understanding. Even if you're not doing Dynamo and you're just trying to understand Revit better, knowing how databases work helps you all of a sudden understand how everything works. And then the second is um, programming. Um, I started in Dynamo with connecting nodes to each other. And I thought of it as like Legos putting Legos on top of each other. Um, but uh, recently I've actually moved a lot of my, of my own work into, into Python. I'm still teaching and encouraging, especially newer people to start in Dynamo. Um, but PyRevit, um, I'll mention, I'm not, I'm not selling it by any means. It's free guys for everyone who wants to use it and goes on top of Revit um, has really given me the ability to kind of grow a little bit into more of the programming space. Um, but that, that's another jump and it takes another jump. So understanding the computation side of things. Um, Marcella, what do you think? What do you think skills that people would be really helpful to understanding some of this stuff? Uh, yeah, you said it. Uh, that revolve around the industry and looking forward is definitely, is definitely coding uh, and, uh, and Dynamo. And if you're using Dynamo and you're saving that graph, well then you are a, you are a coder. It's just that. Definitely. It's just that those boxes and wires are just a visual representation of the scripts that are happening uh, in the background. Uh, and so uh, it's a little easier to wrap your head around it. If you can get your head around input ports and output ports, 
then it's a then it's not too big of a jump to uh, to get into text coding. It's kind of like the uh, uh, it's the gateway. <laughs> it's the gateway. It's uh, definitely a gateway drug. <laughs> yeah, it's the gateway for that. I was going to say that too. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, definitely uh, a programming seeing that uh, even as uh, requirements for for even in our company hiring new personnel uh, because because the the idea what we're really getting at here is um, what you're doing. Maybe you don't know it is that you're basically customizing for your individual or your company workflow. And so what's happening is you're not taking the, the, the software at face value anymore, just using the user interface. You're thinking, how else could I adapt this to my workflow? Because if you think about it, that's what a software company does is they try to figure out what workflow would work kind of generally and then put that in their user interface. So as a, as a, as a uh, AEC professional, what you're doing is you're actually customizing. So it's just taking that, just taking little steps to keep customizing to make your workflow more efficient, better, successful, uh, and that's what you're doing with Dynamo. That's what you're doing with coding. So, so I'm just going to generalize and say, if you can move along the path of customizing, then um, then that that's definitely that's definitely the way you want to head. If it if it's only Dynamo, if it's Dynamo and text coding. If it's if it's moving into areas like like uh, like uh, uh, getting the the grasshopper folks in the office involved. If it means if it means uh, um, if it means touching other APIs like uh, like like the structural analysis software, like eTabs and RAM. Um, I actually I got a little secret. I because uh, the book it was it, it's so heavily uh, focused on graphics. Um, I actually had to learn the Photoshop API so I could do a lot of automations. Uh, so you may see uh, Dynamo for Photoshop pretty soon because uh, I'm kind of working on that module. But anyway, the point is is that you want to talk automate. about a gateway drug. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, the idea is, you know, just that's what you're doing. You're customizing, making your life better. So you move along that path. Uh, you convince other people to do it. Uh, it's a great thing. And that's the trend in the industry. I think the AAC professionals are realizing software out of the box is not is not going to cut it. And if you think about it, that's just kind of been our mentality all along, right? You get Revit in the office. Eventually, you're going to be building custom families. You're going to be modifying it. So this is just the next evolution of that. Is, is tapping that API and getting it getting it done with text coding or boxes and wires or however you however you do it. Yeah. So I have one say, thing to say that, but we do have a lot of questions. I will say that I always tell people, especially the Revit users I work with specifically, that to master Revit is really to master schedules. Kind of alluding to what everybody is saying is that data management, right? If you can manipulate a lot of elements within a schedule you are really well on your way to mastering Revit. And then the next step, as, as Marcelo said, is Dynamo, right? To be able to really manipulate those elements in a very, you know, dramatic way, uh, you know, create these workflows that everybody can use within the office. It's super easy. So one question that we have is, what is the recommended practice of distributing packages and scripts around the office? It looks like SCCM is a pretty common response in there. Thank you for everybody who's, who's posting and commenting in there. Do you guys, Marcelo, Tim, and anyone have any other comments of how these could be distributed? I know it's not easy. Um, get, you want me to go first? Yeah, maybe, please. I want to go first with something that you may think is a bit unconventional, which is uh, whatever medium you decide to distribute, I'll let Tim and take that, like, you know, whatever it is, however you set up your networking, because Tim and you, I'll let you take that. But I just want to say that What's critical about that is the, the education that goes along with it. So if you could document what a script does, you know, whether, I mean, I'm kind of into the one page summaries, but maybe it's not a one page summary. Maybe it's some kind of metadata or something. So as you distribute, then there's not that, uh, there, you, you remove the hesitation of, I don't know how it works. It may be complicated, whatever. If you can eliminate that and you could add the level of, uh, of understanding, maybe even training over the shoulder, however it works. That needs to be just as important as how you physically distribute it. So I'll, I'll, I just want to throw Documentation that in. is half of my job, both mm -hmm. in Dynamo as well as documenting the workflows I create. That's absolutely important. If people can't use the workflows you create, it's useless, right? And please, those of you who are creating Dynamo scripts, use Notes, use Monocle to, <laughs> to, to you know, create the custom node notes and things like that. Those are so appreciative. Um, I literally do that as I work through Dynamo and it takes a little bit of time, but it saves me so much time in the months later when I go back and reference that script. So 
color code, add notes, document, document, document. Absolutely. Tim in something to add? Yeah, or? I'm totally agreeing with my eyes. Um, <laughs> and we have, we have these things that are called the digital recipes. And uh, it's basically what Marcel is talking about. It's like a one page write up about everything that's going to get distributed. And then those go on SharePoint. I don't know, Marcella, where do you put your, uh, your one page documents that other people or you are creating for internal to your office? Oh, they're just, yeah, they're just put on a shared drive with the scripts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe um, there's a more elaborate way to do it, but that's. So is, is, you guys are actually network drive to, so you guys are actually uh, accessing a network drive and pathing to network drives? Yes. Yes, yes. Which in newer versions of Dynamo is much smoother than older versions, luckily. And I think we're still talking about documentation um, in that well, way. Well, he, he mentioned that his scripts were in the same place. Packages as well. Yes, they are. Then their path, the package manager, yes, will we'll match. Yes, that's correct. They're in centrally in one location. That's your question. They are. Um, Before when so, Dynamo was a little slow to use the shared location, I actually I saw there was a comment that you can use Dynamo to copy those to a local location, which I utilize that very frequently, uh, which was really, really nice. But yes, I think the SS, SCCM is definitely going to be the way to go. If you have an IT department, talk to them about that. Um, definitely going to be the smoothest transition to get everything loaded on everybody's machine uh, easily. Yeah, the reality on my side is that, uh, believe it or not, the percentage of Dynamo is much higher uh, that's used on non-Revit projects, uh, non-Revit interactions. So it's sure the e tabs and other things. It's safe. It's SAP. Uh, it's uh, you know it's those. Um, but so uh, those tend to not hang up as much, and so it, it tends to work. But you know I I'm, I understand that it could slow down for for a lot of um, a lot of Revit applications. So we're getting that question a lot lately which is, you know, not just Dynamo, but it, you know, all these things that used to be stored on a network and it's like, okay, how are you doing it now? And um, there is a function that most people have forgotten about just built right into Windows. Um, <clears throat> there is a downside to it, but um, there's a thing called offline folders, which basically what it does is it saves a folder with its network path locally to your computer. Um, and whenever you're not online and it doesn't find the network, you can still get to that folder as you always would. All the software still sees it normally. And that has been a solution to some companies' problems. Um, other companies where they don't have quite so large of hard drives in their laptops anymore, uh, that's not an option. And so they end up having to look uh, to like a cloud solution. Um, and as far, and you know, I don't think there's gonna be a one solve fits all. IT has some really clever solutions. Um, so talk to the IT people that, that know the, the ins and outs. Um, I've seen people make a Dynamo script to copy and maintain that, so. Um, yeah, Nick, can I add a couple things? And then Mike, yeah. I, Michael, I'd love to hear your answer to the question on here about uh, add-ins versus Dynamo one. macro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you got, I know you got it. Um, but before we go there, um, Nick, what our company has done is we've moved everything into SharePoint. Um, so all of our stuff that used to be on the network and shared is on SharePoint. And then we actually sync it to our local drive. And because of smart sync, it doesn't use up the entire hard drive. It only takes the pieces that we're using. So that's actually how most of us have been using it. And if you go back on the Dynamo forums, you're gonna find um, in my past, I was very hand heavy handed about how packages should be managed because I wanted everyone to have the exact same package set up. So it always worked. Um, since uh, joining Walter P. Moore, I've, I've really found um, the culture here thrives on people being able to experiment all over the place. And so we've actually chosen a less heavy handed where we have a place that people can copy packages from like a starter set, but then it really is in a nice way, the wild west for what people can install and tr test because we don't think one or two people can know everything that everyone needs. Um, so I've taken a different shift um, on that um, with regards to the package locations. You want to, you want to ask Michael that question? Sure, yeah, I'll, right. I'm happy to chime in on that. So the, I think it was the difference between Dynamo and macros. Um, and I, I think there's a couple ways to look at this. One is 
the learning curve. So if you're thinking about creating or you want to learn, you know, which one do you want to learn? Certainly Dynamo has a much lower learning curve than learning you know, C-sharp or VB.net. Um, and I think that, uh, Tim, and your comment about uh, Dynamo as a gateway drug is absolutely correct. I had that written down here before you said it. And I think that's a great way um, to get started. I did it the opposite way and I learned programming, um, first VB.net and then C sharp. But it, it, you know, I have a dent in my forehead from just banging my head on the desk because it was just that, um, that difficult if you don't come from that kind of a background. I'm an architect, I'm not a programmer. Um, but once you get you know, into Dynamo, I think as a lot of people are commenting in the chat, like there are issues with regard to how do you, you make sure everybody's using the same package? How do you make sure everybody has the tools available? Like deploying Dynamo in a, in a firm is challenging because of all the things that make Dynamo great. Um, so the other issue is speed. Um, certainly a, like a macro or an add-in, um, it's gonna be compiled so it runs significantly faster. Um, so they're depending on if, the operations that you're doing, if they're computationally intensive, it's going to be significantly faster as a macro as an, or as an add-in than as Dynamo. Um, so I think there, there is that to consider. But for firms who are interested, like are dipping their toes into automation um, and want to create their own tools, I think Dynamo is the way to go because it starts moving you down that path and it starts just changing the way you think about things. Like, okay, you know, here's a problem we can solve this, you know, I, I love this suggestion about write it out in, you know, write out the steps, because that's really the first thing you need to do. Um, and get, get you going on thinking about your own tools and customizing. Um, and then like I'm doing a project now for a company that's built out a large Dynamo library and they've realized they've kind of hit, they hit the limit. Um, and they're, they're a really big firm. So now we're going back and rewriting all their Dynamo scripts as add-ins. Um, but they've they kind of reached that point and they've also changed the culture in the company so that they are people are far more accepting of the custom tools and they're also starting to think of you know okay could we have a tool that does this could we have a tool that does that because i think that is in part a, a cultural change too one thing i'll add is at dynamo dc tim and Lita really wonderful session on being able to capture data from Dynamo. And I think that that is something that is really incredibly useful that, that yeah. we have at Smith Group, yeah. um, being able to know what packages are being used. You know, are, am I maintaining a package in my library that nobody uses, that nobody is utilizing within the standard scripts? Um, what scripts are being used? How often are they being used, et cetera? Maybe those need to be put into a button or thought about in a different process. Um, so understanding how users are using Dynamo as well. I yeah, that's, that's big too, just to, because it's an investment. It's going to require time to manage it, to develop the scripts. I think, Dana, you said too, like a lot of your time is spent on documentation and kind of supporting users. Um, I think being able to go to your firm's management and say, A, like here's the scripts that are being used, and then figuring out a way to calculate how much time is being saved and then more importantly, like translating that into a dollar value. So then you can justify, you know, the investment because it is an investment. Um, but, but to say like, if we invest, you know, X, we're going to get back five X or 10 X or whatever. It looks like we're at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> any, any final question, any final comments? And then we can stay after two. I just want to give um, everybody the moment. I will say, please fill out the survey. You should get an email with a survey. Like, you, like I mentioned earlier, you may win a prize next meeting. So make sure you fill those out. We do utilize those. We definitely want to hear your input. And if you have any recommendations for meetings, we love those as well. Um, once again, please check out yourdeskuniversity.com for information about the new semester. And thank so much to Timon and John Shippers for setting all of that up and all their, all their hard work. Um, and thank you all for your participation in our chat today and being part of the conversation on Dynamo and practical uses. We're going to stay on. Hopefully you guys can too. We understand if you can't, uh, we'll maybe go about three or to five minutes long. We understand we want to you know, respect everybody's time. So please, Tim, and continue. I was just going to ask Nick, because I know Nick, just like Mike, um, I don't know, Mike, Michael, sorry if I, you don't prefer one or the other, but uh, <laughs> Nick, I, I was just thinking like, you get lots of questions about Dynamo and like, oh, how do I do this? How do I solve this for, we've kind of talked about like some of the intro pieces. If, if someone was 
not sure where to, what question to try to at, answer. Do you have some tips on like three or four top like things people are trying to automate that you might recommend they try? Um, so normally like the way I get people starting to think is, you know, it's, you know, what is that task that you do every day that's monotonous that you really wish you didn't have to do anymore? <laughs> um, and normally somebody can find out, you know, think of one thing. Uh, one of the things, um, what, you know, a lot of the things, at least on the architecture side that we hear constantly is, um, drawing, drawing lists and sheet management, um, from a standpoint of one of the things that architects love to do is they love on their drawing list to show the history of the revisions of every sheet and natively in Revit, you can't do that. Um, Revit tracks that information as far as what revisions were on what sheet, but you can't show that in like a matrix style form. And there's about a thousand different workarounds to do that, but they all normally require some kind of manual um, parameter chaos. Um, so, you know, that's a good thing, just as what's something people can think about. Um, another one that, you know, on the examples of practical things, um, I, you guys were talking structural engineers, so I'm going to switch and go to mechanical and electrical. Um, we had one request where, the, you know, mechanical and electrical engineers, if they're in two different models, there's a lot of data that needs to be shared between the two. Um, like mechanical needs a VAV box in their model, but they the electrical needs something in their model so that they could circuit and they need to share the data. And so we were approached with the question of, is there a way that you can actually do this? Can you physically just easily copy the data between the two um, to eliminate the human error aspect? And yeah, that's not that hard of a thing to do. Um, and so, you know, it's those kind of, you know, those tasks, either it's coordination within their own firm or outside. Um, we had an architect that did, does um, high rise apartments and then for the contractor, they needed to figure out which bathroom and kitchen types were mirrored and not mirrored and which units they tied to and this whole like matrix thing, which, you know, Revit can track all of that, but you can't really easily schedule all that information. So it was a matter of that kind of data manipulation. And, and that's where we see a lot of people asking. It's either the, you know, I have this task. I don't like doing it. It's repetitive. It's monotonous. Can I, can I get, is there some way of doing this? Um, I had a structural engineer ask me this random question, a QC guy. And he was like, I keep seeing drawings where the grid lines aren't dimensioned on drawings. And they're like, is there any way that I can make sure that's happened? And it's like, well, yeah, you can do that with Dynamo. That, that's an easy one too. You want to talk about like five nodes to make it happen. That's, that's right up there. So it's, you know, it's those frustration moments. And you were talking about like programming as, uh, as like something that there, maybe it was Marcelo was talking about looking at. The nice thing is if you see somebody who understands programming, what it also means is that they can actually take a large task and break it down into the individual parts. And, you know, that goes back to where we started with this is simplify everything. Don't think about the big task. And, you know, when you go to the forum, don't ask for the big task because you probably aren't going to get the answer. But if you break it down into the individual parts and pieces of what you're trying to do, you'll probably find the answer is already up there. <laughs> um, somebody has probably already stumbled onto the answer somehow. So... Any other final thoughts from the panelists or Marcelo? Well, I would like to, mm -hmm. Nick, if you can unmute today, today, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. I know him, <laughs> I know him. Um, but just so that he can um, come in and, and say a few things. He's been really, really wonderful in participating in the chat here. And once again, thank you all for, for coming in today, participating, doing the polls. Please, please fill out the surveys. Hey, today, welcome. Hey.
Thanks, uh, thanks for unmuting me. It's perfect. Um, yeah, so far, great talk. This is the kind of stuff I love to hear. It's, it's like we're all sharing the same struggle. It's uh, very comforting to <laughs> uh, kind of talk about it. But <clears throat> just quickly on this topic, um, of like what kind of use cases, um, I, I think everybody hit the nail on the head of like, you know, typical things that everybody does that can be automated is the perfect start. Um, and one thing I'd add is uh, in my company, we're trying to deploy Dynamo. And the key thing is to show people as far as like, if, if you want to get other examples from other people, kind of broaden the net of people who can bring you samples. Uh, I would say the, the key thing I keep getting back is, okay, we, we get the idea of how it works when I talk to people, but it's also, uh, how would I start making a graph? And that's like, oh, that's a good question. Because once you do it 50 times, you kind of like learn my muscle memory how to solve a problem. But if they don't know, how do you make it easier? And the thing I always figured out was, based on the feedback, because we can follow just about any graph, but um, how would we figure out what to create on our own? And I usually tell them, what is it you're trying to solve? That's your output. That'll be the nodes all the way off to the right. And to get to that output, what would you put into the whole thing? And that's your nodes all the way off to the left as the inputs. And then everything else in, the mid in between tends to just be list management and a few other specialty nodes, uh, filters and things like that. So. I've noticed that's like uh, Marcelo was talking earlier, like just and Timon and everybody was talking earlier, just keep it simple. And that's really it. It's like um, input, process, output. So that was something I just wanted to uh, mention. It's uh, if anybody ever wanted to either learn it themselves or just still trying to figure it out or train their staff. It's that simple. Uh, ask them, what are you trying to solve? Let's talk about the outputs. What would the inputs need to be to get the outputs and what's the list management to uh, get that far? And, and I'll take you pretty far because sometimes I'm only going to guess if I'm the content editor for the scripts, what people want. I have no idea. Sometimes it's, it's like, until you like sit down and work with them when you can because we're all remote, you don't know. So you can, you should be able to empower every user to um, figure it out themselves and then maybe help them along. And that's a great way to find use cases because usually if one or two people are needing the solution, a lot more do. So I just want to throw that in there because Sometimes we can only guess unless somebody explicitly tells us, you know. So I just wanted to hope that that adds some uh, inspiration to getting people to try it themselves, make it easy, and then um, you, you can start embedding scripts from your company and your staff. I think that's a great thing. The only thing I want to add to that is when you're talking about, okay, you find where, you know, what you're going to make at the end, you know, what you're going to use to, to solve your problem, and, and you look at it and you figure out what it needs. Don't necessarily use what it needs is figuring out what you want users to fill in. Think about what, how, you know, what information you want the users to fill in, what information, and this is almost equally, if not more important, is what information do you not want the users to provide? <laughs> um, you know, what do you want to lock down so that it's standardized? Um, you know, the more input you make, yeah, the more flexible it is, but it's also more confusing. So it goes against that simplification process. So, um, yeah, start, uh, you know, start with where you're going, figure out where you are, and then just work in between. Welcome, Marcelo. Do you want to wrap us up? Maybe give us a closing comment or two? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, okay. Final yeah. thought? Yeah, well, uh, I think I already reiterated it. Um, basically, uh, basically, uh, you're customizing. So, uh, Find a way that is uh, that makes sense to you, uh, and if you're trying to convince others to use it, which is going to always be the case, uh, then make sure you make it simple. Uh, make sure that training is part of, of sharing, uh, and make sure you are having fun. I kind of feel like if you're using Dynamo and you're not having fun, you're probably doing something wrong. So, so uh, let's let's leave it at that. Well, thank you so much, Marcelo. Thank you, Timon. Michael, Nick, for being panelists today. And thank you, everyone, for participating today and joining our conversation. I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next month.